Hello, my name is Dr. Mary O'Kane, and I'd like to thank Kerry Libraries for inviting me to make this little video for you um, on supporting anxious children. Um, my plan for the video is to have a quick look at some figures of um, some research and anxiety for children in Ireland. Then I'm going to explain to you exactly how anxiety is affecting your child, affecting their brain and affecting them physically. And then I'm going to go through three tips that you can put into place that will really support your anxious child. OK, so before we start, um, I'd like you to have a look at this little picture on my first slide and have a look at these children on this roller coaster. And I'd like you to imagine what they might be feeling. All the children are going on the same ride together, but the expressions on their faces are a little bit different. So if we look at that little boy with his hands in the air, thoroughly enjoying his roller coaster ride, um, I imagine that when he comes off that ride, he's going to say to his mom, oh, that was brilliant. It was so much fun. I loved it. He's going to be running to the back of the queue to go on that ride again. It was so exciting. He wants to try it one more time. But if I look at the little girl at the very front and I'm looking at her expression and I'm thinking not quite the same reaction. She's having the same experience as that little boy, but her facial expression is quite different. And I'm imagining that perhaps that little girl could come off that ride and her mum will say, oh, do you want to go on the ride again? And she might go, no never again. I hated that ride. I thought I was going to be flung from that roller coaster and, and the belt, it, it wasn't down properly. I, I, I thought I could die and the noise, it didn't sound safe. And if her mum says, do you think you'd like to go again? She'd be, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to go on that again, ever. And say her mum takes her to another ride in the fairground and her mum might say, oh, here's a, here's a little ride. We'll go on that one instead and the little girl might think yeah okay we'll give this a try and then something inside her might say to her remember that roller coaster remember your experience on that you, you thought you were going to be thrown from it this ride it's making similar noises and and the safety bar looks very similar and she may just decide i'm not giving that one a try either so why do these children respond differently? They have had the same experience. They've been on the same ride. They both had their mums along in with them. But clearly there is something within them that is responding differently to the same situation. So we'll have a little think about what that might be as we go through this video. OK, so my first slide here is giving you a few statistics on levels of anxiety for our children in Ireland. Um, this research was conducted by a lady called Mary Cannon. She's from the Royal College of Surgeons um, and she had some really interesting findings. But one of the figures that jumps out at me is that she found one in three of our children in Ireland by the age of 13 had experienced some mental health difficulty. Not all anxiety, but anxiety was very high among her figures. She also found that our figures in Ireland for mental health difficulties were higher than the UK or the US counterparts. So clearly, if you're watching this video thinking, oh my gosh, you know, my child is struggling with this, you are not alone. There are so many of us in exactly the same boat. Her figure, one in three children, really resonates with me because I'm the mum of three and one of mine struggles with anxiety. So I'm living the dream along with you and I know how difficult um, it will be. So I didn't put those figures up to frighten you, but just to make you really aware, oh, you are not alone. So what can we do about it? Well, the first thing we can do is to get an understanding ourselves and to be able to understand to our children what is happening when they are feeling anxious. So I'll have a little look at what I call the science bit. Okay, what is anxiety? The first thing your child needs to know is that anxiety is actually good. Now, if you say that to a child, that will be completely counterintuitive. Anxiety feels awful. It certainly doesn't feel good. So how can it be good? 
However, it, it really comes from our body's alarm system. So it's like a little protective system within us designed to keep us safe. That's important because this system is actually like a little warrior within us trying to protect us. It's on our side. Might not get it right all the time, but it's actually in there trying to protect us. Your child is not alone in experiencing anxiety. We all feel anxiety at times. Everybody does. I suppose it's probably on a scale. So for some of us, we might tootle along, not feel too anxious unless maybe we have a big exam coming up. Not feel too anxious unless we have to go somewhere frightening that we haven't been before. So it, it's different for each person. Think of those children on the roller coaster ride. But for some of us, it can become a bit of a problem. It can cause us to struggle in our everyday life. So this science bit, what is happening inside your child's brain when they are, when this alarm system, if you like, goes off? Well, anxiety comes from a place in our brain we call the amygdala. So it's right in the center of our brain. If you look at that little picture I have on the screen now, the idea of the hand, we often use our hand when we're talking about our brain. So if my thumbnail is the amygdala right inside and I tuck my fingers around, the amygdala is right in the center of my brain. So what is the amygdala? It's part of what we call the limbic system. And it is literally, I like to think about it, a little warrior in there, as I said, designed to protect us. So what does it do? It takes in information from our senses. It could be something we hear. If I'm um, driving along in my car and I hear a screech of brakes to my right, the amygdala responds. It could be something we smell. I might smell burning. The amygdala responds. It responds to any information taken in by the senses and it responds to the thoughts also within our brains. So what does it do when it responds? It's looking for danger. It is on alert for any danger that it needs to be aware of because it wants to protect us. So when the amygdala senses anything it can consider danger, it causes chemical reactions within our body. So say back in hunter-gatherer times, if I was going out to hunt one morning and I hear a rustle in the bushes, before I have the time to turn my head and see what that potential threat might be, the amygdala has responded. It's realized I could be in danger and it jumps into action to save me. What it does, is it causes these chemical reactions, but it causes physical responses within my body. So my heart starts pounding because that limbic system is trying to pump blood to my extremities. I might need to fight, I might need to flight. It causes my breathing to change. My breathing can become more shallow. My breathing can become more fast. Maybe I'm feeling lightheaded. The adrenaline that's washing around my body can make my arms feel shaky. It shuts down my digestive system. So I'm experiencing all these physical responses, maybe butterflies in my tummy, heart pounding, arms feeling a little bit shaky, but they are actually caused by this little warrior trying to keep me safe. So it's important that your child re realizes that that's what's happening. If they picture a little warrior inside the brain, it can help them with that understanding. One important thing the amygdala also does when it goes into this state of panic, if you like, to try and save me, is it cuts off all contact to the front of my brain. And if I go back to this hand analogy, so the amygdala is tucked in there and my fingers in behind my forehead are what we call the prefrontal cortex, the thinking brain. If you're speaking to children, it's our thinking brain. What does our thinking brain do? It is the area of the brain that's responsible for planning, for organization, for logical thought. In a situation of fight or flight, the amygdala is in control. It cuts off contact to this thinking brain, which is not necessarily a good thing because our thinking brain can help our children work out what they need to do in a situation. Another important thing about the amygdala, about this whole system, is it works just like a smoke alarm in your house. So if I have a smoke alarm in my house and um, it recognizes that there is smoke, there is potential danger, but it can't tell the difference between perceived danger and real danger. 
It just recognises danger. The amygdala responds the same way. It can't actually tell if my house is burning down or if I've just burnt the toast. It doesn't matter. Its role is to protect me and that is what it does. Well, the amygdala is the same. So if I can give you an example. In my house, uh, my husband has a smoke alarm outside my kitchen door. So say I set off that smoke alarm and say two of my children are sitting on the sofa and the smoke alarm goes off. The two who wouldn't necessarily have particularly anxious brains, they're the two on the roller coaster with their hands in the air. So they're sitting on the sofa and they hear the smoke alarm. And what do they do? They probably give each other a bit of a dig. You go, you go. But they know they have to respond. They know it's alerting them to danger. One of them eventually, they get up and up they get and they go in and they check what's happening in the kitchen. They look around, so they're evaluating the situation. They see burnt toast in the toaster and they think, oh, mum burnt the toast. And they get a tea towel and they flop, flop, flop that smoke alarm and they reset the alarm. Say my child who struggles a bit with anxiety is sitting in the sitting room and that smoke alarm goes off. So she's sitting there, smoke alarm goes off. Does she stop to look for somebody else to go in and investigate this? No, 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 no. Danger. She responds to danger immediately, jumps up, goes in to investigate. So it's as if she looks at the burning toast in the toaster and thinks, oh, it's only burning toast. But then the thought comes into her head, that toast is still smouldering. That toast could still go on fire. I'm not really sure that this is particularly a safe situation. There could potentially be danger here. She goes to get her tea towel. She half-heartedly flaps that tea towel, but she's not entirely convinced. She is the child at the front of the roller coaster. She's having that different experience. Same situation, different experience. So still burnt toast in both cases, but quite a different response from the child. So what we need to think about is those children at the front of that roller coaster. There's children that it is as if that whole limbic system is just a little bit off kilter. So it's as if my smoke alarm is set maybe a little bit too high. When I investigate, when I evaluate, perhaps I'm not making as accurate evaluation as the child at the back of the roller coaster with their hands in the air. So even though I flap and reset my alarm, that whole system is just slightly out of kilter with the way it potentially could be. So is there something that we can do to help them? They're most definitely. So the first thing I would say to you, which is one of the most important skills we can equip our children with is what we call controlled breathing. With young children, we tend to call it belly breathing for them. So is this just breathing? Not quite. It's slightly different from just the normal breathing in and out. If you look at newborn babies and you watch the way they breathe, they breathe down into their tummies. When they breathe, you actually see their tummy moving. You see them breathing right down into their belly. Very often by the time our children are in preschool, they actually don't breathe that way anymore. They start to breathe into their chest and particularly for children who are struggling with anxiety. When that little warrior sets off and tries to protect us, it changes our breathing and we're much more likely to breathe into our chest. So one of the first tips I would say to you is to teach your child controlled breathing. So how do we, how do we breathe in this way? You inhale through your nose with children, we usually use a count of three or four. So they inhale within their nose. We want them to inhale right down into their tummy. They hold that breath for a count of three. They exhale for a count of three. Pause. And they repeat again until they feel calm. You may have heard it called four, seven, eight. It's a similar type of breathing um, in adults. But with children, it is this just slow, calm breathing right down into the tummies. 
we usually teach it to children by using what we call a breathing buddy. And a breathing buddy is any cuddly toy that a child can lie down, put the toy on their tummy, and they can actually watch the toy moving as they breathe. So you know those little beanie baby type toys that you can actually will stay still on their tummy are a great way of teaching them. There's no point in trying to teach this to your child when they are caught in the grip of anxiety. It won't work. The idea is we want to start the child doing this breathing every day. They might do it last thing before bed. I would really encourage last thing. They might do it in the morning before they go to school. Perhaps they'll do it when they come in from school after they're fed and watered. When they come in from school, they might do it again. But the idea is that we learn it. It becomes a learned behavior through repetition and reinforcement. We're reminding them how well this works and they're doing it on an ongoing basis. The idea is that if they learn to do this when they are calm, when they're feeling safe, when they're feeling secure, it is a behavior that they can then put in place when they actually really need it in those anxious moments. We know now that what we do, how we respond to anxiety can have a very big effect on whether it lasts. And this controlled breathing is scientifically proven to actually bring down the heart rate, to lower the bl blood pressure. It's as if this breathing sends a little message back up to that amygdala that, oh no, she thinks everything's fine. No, she's breathing really calmly. You know, she's breathing really calmly. Everything must be okay. So it's sending that message back that they needn't worry, that all is well. The next little tip I would encourage you to use is what we call either a worry time or a worry box. Very often our children who struggle with anxiety, they don't just worry in one place or one situation. Their, their anxiety can stay with them throughout the day. So they will usually be anxious in many different situations. And this little idea of worry time or a worry box helps them offload some of those worries. It's as if you're just taking that little weight off your shoulder. Again, I would encourage you to do this on an ongoing basis every day. When, when the world feels unsafe to our children, routine and rituals and um, those familiar things that we have in our life help them to feel safe. So again, perhaps every day when they come in from school, again every evening when they go to bed, they have this time with you. The idea of this time is that you are giving them absolute one-on-one -on -one attention. So phone gone, it's not while you're making the dinner, it's not while you're doing something else, it's absolute attention you and the child, and they can talk to you about any worries they have had during the day. If they're an older child and they want to write them down, they can write them down themselves. You can put them this little pet worry monster in the picture. You know, I eat your worry, troubles and worries, so you don't have to, you know, they remove them from you. You can either put them in a worry box, they can just write them down, they can just talk them through. It's really individual, it's what works for your child. We encourage you to write it down or even with younger children, sometimes they can draw them because actually putting the worry on paper can help. Again, it's like little you're, you're removing it from your shoulder. So we would encourage you to do that. During this time, anything the child is worried about constitutes a worry. So never like, oh, no, don't worry about that. No, no, no. Anything that constitutes a worry, they can share and you empathize and you show them that you care about the struggle or the worry that they have had that day. But the idea is we try to limit this time. So we limit the time. So maybe they come in from school and we have our worry time. We sit and we go through anything that they thought about. When they've offloaded the worries, that time is limited. Now we're going to park that until perhaps bedtime. If you're doing worry time and the breathing at bedtime, always do breathing last. So worry time might become you know, before their bath or before their story or whatever. So you have your worry time, then something else. So we have this time, say then you're making the dinner and your child comes up and is, oh, mum, I never told you earlier. Oh, I have three other worries I meant to tell you. And I, I was supposed to be telling you about those. 
we the, we don't want to have worry time all evening long. We want to try and compartmentalize it. If something has happened during that evening that's upset them, obviously we break and we talk about it. But say they, those three little worries were three little things that happened in school earlier that they'd forgotten. You don't want to dismiss them. So you want to empathize first. So you would say something like, oh, I really want to hear about that. Wow, I, you need to tell me all about that later. Will you save that for worry time? I want to hear all about that in worry time. Now, look at the rain out there. I thought we might get our wellies on and splash in it. So you're empathizing, you're telling them we'll save it for worry time, but try and divert them with something that might take their mind off that worry. And again, but don't forget in the evening to go through the worry time again. If they have worries during the day when they're in school, again, with a child struggling with anxiety, you don't want them spending that whole school day thinking about that worry. Try to encourage them to save the worry in a little worry box in their head. I'm gonna save that worry to talk to mum or dad or granny, whoever, later on. It really can be a useful little way of, of parking that worry. Children who struggle with anxiety tend to ruminate over a worry. We go over and over, maybe we catastrophize, maybe we start thinking it's so much worse than it is. By trying to have that time where you pour everything out, it can then give you a bit of breathing space after that to do other things. The third tip then to help your children is to think about ourselves. So we've said that some of our children are that little girl at the front of the roller coaster. It's as if they're naturally more predisposed to anxiety, to worry, to being on alert and seeing the danger in the world. OK, so we know that that's how some of our children respond. But it also helps us to look at ourselves. Probably the most important tool that you have to support your child struggling with anxiety is you. It, it, it's us, it's being there for them. It is being that space where they can offload in their worry time. It's being that person who will practice their breathing and will practice tools with them. But also really importantly, it's being the person who will help them find their brave help them to understand that they have it in them to face the world, to be that person who absolutely believes that they can do it. And that's my third tip for you. And it's to think about how we respond when our children become anxious. I said to you at the beginning, I'm a mother of three. And when I look at my own parenting, I can see that I parent my child who struggles with anxiety, in potentially a more anxious way myself. I potentially respond differently to that child than perhaps I would the other two. And I've got these two little chickens on this slide here to remind me to tell you a story. And this story comes from an absolutely wonderful book. I would highly recommend it. I have a little reading list at the end, so I'll, I'll repeat the name for you again. But the book is called The Opposite of Worry by a man called Lawrence Cohen. And he's a clinical psychologist based in America. He struggled with anxiety in his youth and so did one of his children. However, brilliant book. And um, he tells this story in the book about when he was in high school and he did a project on chickens for one of his high school projects. So he tells the story that chickens, if they are in that fight or flight stage that I was talking about earlier with children, we say fight or flight because it's easier to say, but it actually is fight, flight or freeze. And chickens go into the freeze end. What it is called in chickens is tonic immobilization. You might have heard it called playing possum, they say in America. The idea is when I'm under threat, I play dead. I, I hide in here and I play dead. So if I'm a chicken and there is a vulture circling overhead, and I think, whoa, I'm in danger. It's as if the chicken amygdala goes freeze. So I freeze down here. You know, no chicken here, no chicken to be seen here. All is good. And I'm, I'm staying really still, hoping that that will keep me safe. So in his high school project, Lawrence Cohen timed 
how long chickens go into this state of tonic immobilization births. And he found on average, it's about a minute. So he experimented with this and he got a second chicken to mosey along. He put his second chicken in a pen with that first chicken. So the second chicken came along and saw the first chicken frozen. And the second chicken immediately, without having to sense the danger, he didn't need to see any vulture. He saw the first chicken frozen and what did he do? She froze too. It's as if he thought, well, he knows there's something going on. I better panic, I better freeze too. So they both went into a state of tonic immobilization. Lawrence Cohen timed them. And when that second chicken responded with fright, they, the two chickens froze for an average five minutes. So an awful lot longer. If he put another chicken away wandering around, not able to see the first chicken, and I'm the first chicken frozen and I spot out of the corner my beady little eye, a chicken wandering around thinking life is good, I would come out of tonic immobilization a lot more quickly. Really interesting. What freaked the chickens out more than anything was if you put a mirror in front of them and they saw themselves frozen, they thought they were a second chicken and they would freeze forever because they were looking at the reflection frozen. But what's the moral of the story? Lawrence Cohen tells us the moral of the story is with our anxious chick with our anxious children, don't be the second chicken. Don't be that chicken that causes the anxiety to go on for longer. And I know I've looked at my parenting and sometimes I have to say to myself, Mary, second chicken, you'll watch what we're doing. So think about the way you respond to your child when they're in that state, when they are feeling anxious. Do you respond the way I know I have done in the past in feeling, oh no, no, no I can see the anxiety brewing and I can feel it rising within myself. My amygdala, my alarm system is sensing threat. Or do I do my controlled breathing? Do I take a deep breath and remind myself of how strong and how capable my child actually is? Because if I remind myself, I'm then able to remind my child. So if we really want to make sure we're trying not to be that second chicken, what do we do? We empathize with them. You know, when they're feeling that way, empathy is the first thing they need. They need a, you know, a hug. I always think empathy is just like a hug. They need that. But then I need to project calm. So to say something like, you know, oh, I can see this is really worrying you. I can see that you're scared of this. I can see that you're feeling really nervous about this. But, and the but is the key word. But I also know, you know, I've also seen you do this before and I know you can handle it. I've also seen you do so well in this situation, which makes me see that you can handle the next one. You know, a child, perhaps a child going back to school after COVID who may have been nervous. And you can say, you know, I can see that you're worried about this. But I look at how well you handled lockdown. And I saw how strong you were. I saw how brave you were. And I know you can do this again. It's, it's showing faith, showing that they might feel the world is unsafe, but we know actually the world is a safe place. Lawrence Cohen, in his story of second chickens, uses what he calls the second chicken question. And it's, will you look in my eyes, look in my eyes and tell me, do I look scared? And it's just letting them know, I know this will be okay. So wonderful advice. So they were the three tips. We watch our breathing, teach them breathing. They need to learn it over time when they're calm so they can put it into place when they're stressed. We think about a worry time or a worry box and we look at ourselves. We remember our brave, we remember their brave. See this little goldfish in this picture? This is us. We are that goldfish and we have to put that shark fin on our backs as parents sometimes. We have to find our brave to help them find their brave. We have to allow them to go out there, take risks. We have to allow them to do this so that they can show themselves just how brave they are. That's how they're going to build more confidence in the world. They have their breathing, they know we're there for them and they're going to go out of the comfort zone and find their brave. 
Last thing here, and I love this. Am I a good mother, Susan? My name's Amy. Good enough parenting. And I, I always I finish everything with this because it's such an important message. We don't have to be perfect. We will never be perfect. If you think to yourself, oh, I'm a second chicken. You know what? Most of us have been there. It, that's fine. We get it wrong sometimes. We get it wrong, but we learn. We learn, we grow, and we put new things into practice. 80-20 rule, I always think, try and be our best 80% of the time. That's what we're aiming for. We're never going to get it 100% of the time. Recommended reading now before I finished. If you want to look at, speak to somebody in any of the Kerry libraries, if they don't have any of these books available within the Kerry library system, they will be able to order them in for you. This is a book, the, the most wonderful book on anxiety for parents. Honestly, it's always my number one recommendation. The Opposite of Worry by Lawrence Cohen would highly recommend. For preschool children, Hey Warrior, great book by Karen Young um, in Australia. Magic Moment by Niall Breslin, Mindfully Me, there are a wonderful little three pack of books by Louise Shanaher, Wilma Jean, The Worry Machine, The Kissing Hand, brilliant for children who are worried about separation anxiety, and Owl Babies, gorgeous little book. For older children, I'd recommend What to Do When You Worry Too Much by Dawn Hubner is a brilliant book for about the six to 12 year olds. She has a slightly older version as well, which is called Outsmarting Worry, which is really good. OCD, a great little book. Again, maybe the six to 12 year olds. And I know a lot of parents have been asking me about this because of COVID. I think our children are becoming maybe more worried about germs. This is a, another great little book. What to do when your brain gets stuck. There, there's a full range of what to do when books that go through all different emotions with children and they're really excellent little books again if you ask in the library if they don't have them in they'll order them for you but i did check today and they have a great range of them um, available and the coping skills for kids workbook again i love the recommendation can i just finish by saying something which is important to you particularly at a time when we have a lot of uncertainty in our world so many of our children are struggling with anxiety, with worries at the moment, and that is absolutely fine. That's normal. It's to be expected. I think as parents, so many of us have struggled um, in this very uncertain time. However, if you would say to yourself that your child's anxiety is significantly affecting their life, and ask yourself that question, is this significantly affecting their ability to live their life. If it is, I would say to you, please go to your GP and get a referral. You may need a referral for a clinical psychologist. You might get a referral for CAMS, for primary care. Your GP might say, having spoken to you and your child, you know what, a few sessions of play therapy. There are so many options open, but think of that word, it's significantly affecting their life. Always go to your GP. Um, in case there are waiting lists and you have to wait a little while. So guys, I hope you found that helpful um, and it's given you the, a better understanding of what's happening in your child's brain and it's given you those three little tips for things that you might want to put into practice. And um, if you would like to keep in touch, my Facebook page is Dr. Mary O'Kane Early Years, my Twitter is at MOK Early Years, and my Instagram is Dr. Mary O'Kane. And I'd just like to finish by saying thank you once again to Kerry Libraries for inviting me to give this talk. And I really hope that you have found it useful.